Crime and Punishment, Chapter 2. Raskolnikov was not used to crowds, and, as we said before, he avoided society of every sort, more especially of late. But now, all at once, he felt a desire to be with other people. Something new seemed to be taking place within him, and with it he felt a sort of thirst for company. He was so weary after a whole month of concentrated wretchedness and gloomy excitement that he longed to rest, if only for a moment, in some other world, whatever it might be. And, in spite of the filthiness of the surroundings, he was glad now to stay in the tavern. The master of the establishment was in another room, but he frequently came down some steps into the main room, his jaunty, tarred boots with, run with red turnover tops coming into view each time before the rest of his person. He wore a full coat and a horribly greasy black satin waistcoat, with no cravat, and his whole face seemed smeared with oil like an iron lock. At the counter stood a boy of about fourteen, and there was another boy, somewhat younger, who handed whatever was wanted. On the counter lay some sliced cucumber, some pieces of dried black bread, and some fish, chopped up small, all smelling very bad. It was insufferably close, and so heavy with the fumes of spirits, that five minutes in such an atmosphere might well make a man drunk. There are chance meetings with strangers that interest us from the first moment, before a word is spoken. Such was the impression made on Raskolnikov by the person sitting a little distance from him, who looked like a retired government clerk. The young man often recalled this impression afterwards, and even ascribed it to presentiment. He looked repeatedly at the clerk, partly no doubt because the latter was staring persistently at him, obviously anxious to enter into conversation. At the other persons in the room, including the tavern keeper, the clerk looked as though he were used to their company, and weary of it, showing a shade of, co of condescending contempt for them as persons of station and culture inferior to his own, with whom it would be useless for him to converse. He was a man of over fifty, bald and grizzled, of medium height, and stoutly built. His face, bloated from continual drinking, was of a yellow, even greenish tinge, with swollen eyelids, out of which keen reddish eyes gleamed like little chinks. But there was something very strange in him. There was a light in his eyes as though of intense feeling. Perhaps there were even thought and intelligence, but at the same time there was a gleam of something like madness. He was wearing an old and hopelessly ragged black dress coat, with all its buttons missing except one, and that one he had buttoned evidently clinging to this last trace of respectability. A crumpled short shirt front, covered with spots and stains, protruded from his canvas waistcoat. Like a clerk, he wore no beard, nor mustache, but had been so long unshaven that his chin looked like a stiff grayish brush. And there was something respectable and like an official about his manner, too. But he was restless. He ruffled up his hair and from time to time let his head drop into his hands, dejectedly resting his ragged elbows on the stained and sticky table. At last he looked straight at Raskolnikov and said loudly and resolutely, May I venture, honored sir, to engage you in polite conversation? For as much as, though your exterior would not command respect, my experience admonishes me that you are a man of education and not accustomed to drinking. I have always respected education when in conjunction with genuine sentiments, and I am besides a titular consular in rank. Marmeladov, that such is my name, titular consular. I make bold to inquire, have you been in the service? No, I am studying, answered the young man, somewhat surprised at the grandiloquent style of the speaker and also at being so directly addressed. In spite of the momentary desire, he had just been feeling for company of any sort. On being actually spoken to, he felt immediately his habitual irritable and uneasy aversion for any stranger who approached or attempted to approach him. A student, then, or formerly a student, cried the clerk. Just what I thought. I'm a man of experience, immense experience, sir, and he tapped his forehead with his fingers in self-approval. You've been a student or have attended some learned institution, but allow me. He got up, staggered, 
took up his jug and his glass, and sat down beside the young man, facing him a little sideways. He was drunk, but spoke fluently and boldly, only occasionally losing the thread of his sentences and drawling into words. He pounced upon Raskolnikov as greedily as though he had not spoken to a soul for a month. Honored sir, he began almost with solemnity. Poverty is not a vice, that's a true saying. Yet I know too that drunkenness is not a virtue, and that that's even truer. But beggary, honored sir, beggary is a vice. In poverty you may still retain your innate nobility of soul, but in beggary, never, no one. For beggary a man is not chased out of human society with a stick. He is swept out with a broom, so as to make it as humiliating as possible. And quite right, too, for as much as in beggary I am ready to be the first to humiliate myself. Hence the pothouse. Honored sir, a month ago Mr. Lebeziatnikov gave my wife a beating, and my wife is a very different matter from me. Do you understand? Allow me to ask you another question out of simple curiosity. Have you ever spent a night on a hay barge on the Neva? No, I have not happened to, answered Raskolnikov. What do you mean? Well... I've just come from one, and it's the fifth night I've slept so. He filled his glass, emptied it, and paused. Bits of hay were in, were in fact hanging to his clothes and sticking to his hair. It seemed quite probable that he had not undressed or washed for the last five days. His hands, particularly, were filthy. They were fat and red with black nails. His conversation seemed to excite a general, though languid, interest. The boys at the counter fell to sniggering. The innkeeper came down from the upper room, apparently on purpose to listen to the funny fellow, and sat down at a little distance, yawning lazily, but with dignity. Evidently, Marmeladov was a familiar figure here, and he had most likely acquired his weakness for high-flown speeches from the habit of frequently entering into conversation with strangers of all sorts in the tavern. This habit develops into a necessity in some drunkards, and especially in those who are looked after sharply and kept in order at home. Hence, in the company of other drinkers, they try to justify themselves, and even, if possible, obtain consideration. Funny fellow, pronounced the innkeeper. And why don't you work? Why aren't you at your duty if you're in the service? Why am I not at my duty, honored sir? Marmeladov went on, addressing himself exclusively to Raskolnikov, as though it had been he who put that question to him. Why am I not at my duty? Does not my heart ache to think what a useless worm I am? A month ago, when Mr. Lebeziatnikov beat my wife with his own hands, and I lay drunk, didn't I suffer? Excuse me, young man, has it ever happened to you? Hmm. Well, to petition hopelessly for a loan? Yes, it has. But what do you mean by hopelessly? Hopelessly in the fullest sense, when you know beforehand that you will get nothing by it. You know, for instance, beforehand with positive certainty that this man, this most reputable and exemplary citizen will on no consideration give you money. And indeed I ask you, why should he? For he knows of course that you shan't pay it back. From compassion? But Mr. Lebeziatnikov, who keeps up with modern ideas, explained the other day that compassion is forbidden nowadays by science itself, and that that's what is done now in England, where there is political economy. Why, I ask you, should he give it to me? And yet, though I know beforehand that he won't, I said off to him and... Why do you go? put in Raskolnikov. Well, when one has no one, nowhere else one can go. For every man must have somewhere to go, since there are times when one absolutely must go somewhere. When my own daughter first went out with a yellow ticket, then I had to go, for my daughter has a yellow passport, he added in parenthesis, looking for a certain uneasiness at the young man. No matter, sir, no matter. He went on hurriedly, and with apparent composure, when both the boys at the counter guffawed, and even the innkeeper smiled. No matter, I am not confounded by the wagging of their heads, for everyone knows everything about it already, and all that is secret is made open. And I accept it all not with contempt, but with humility. So be it. So be it. Behold the man. Excuse me, young man. Can you... No, to put it more strongly and more distinctly, not can you, but dare you. Looking upon me, assert that I am not a pig? The young man did not answer a word. Well, the orator began again stolidly and with even increased dignity, after waiting for the laughter in the room to subside. Well, so be it. I am a pig, but she is a lady. 
I have the semblance of a beast, but Katerina Ivanovna, my spouse, is a person of education and an officer's daughter. Granted, granted, I am a scoundrel, but she is a woman of a noble heart, full of sentiments, refined by education. And yet, oh, if only she felt for me! Honored sir, honored sir, you know every man ought to have at least one place where people feel for him. But Katerina Ivanovna, though she is magnanimous, she is unjust. And yet, although I realize that when she pulls my hair she only does it out of pity, for I repeat without being ashamed, she pulls my hair, young man, he declared with redoubled dignity, hearing the sniggering again. But, my God, if she would but once, but no, no, it's all in vain and it's no use talking, no use talking, for more than once my wish did come true, and more than once she has felt for me, but such is my fate, and I am a beast by nature. Rather, assented the innkeeper, yawning. Marmeladov struck his fist resolutely on the table. Such is my fate. Do you know, sir, do you know, I have sold her very stockings for drink? Not her shoes, that would be more or less in the order of things, but her stockings, her stockings I have sold for drink. Her mohair shawl I sold for drink, a present to her long ago. Her own property, not mine. And we live in a cold room, and she caught cold this winter, and has been coughing and spitting blood, too. We have three little children, and Katerina Ivanovna is at work from morning till night. She is scrubbing and cleaning and washing the children, for she's been used to cleanliness from a child. But her chest is weak, and she has a tendency to consumption, and I feel it. Do you suppose I don't feel it? And the more I drink, the more I feel it. That's why I drink, too. I try to find sympathy and feeling in drink. I drink so that I may suffer twice as much. And as though in despair, he laid his head down on the table. Young man, he went on, raising his head again, in your face I seem to read some trouble of mind. When you came in I read it, and that was why I addressed you at once. For in unfolding, for in unfolding to you the story of my life, I do not wish to make myself a laughing stock before these idle listeners, who indeed know all about it already, but I am looking for a man of feeling and education. Know then that my wife was educated in a high-class school for the daughters of noblemen, and on leaving she danced the shawl dance before the governor and other personages, for which she was presented with a gold medal and a certificate of merit. The medal, well, the medal, of course, was sold long ago. Hmm. But the certificate of merit is in her trunk still, and not long ago she showed it to our landlady, and although she is most continually on bad terms with the landlady, yet she wanted to tell someone or other of her past honors and of the happy days that are gone. I don't condemn her for it. I don't blame her. For the one thing left her is recollection of the past, and all the rest is dust and ashes. Yes, yes, she is a lady of spirit, proud and determined. She scrubs the floors herself and has nothing but black bread to eat, but won't allow herself to be treated with disrespect. That's why she would not overlook Mr. Lebeziatnikov's rudeness to her. And so when he gave her a beating for it, she took to her bed more from the hurt to her feelings than from the blows. She was a widow when I married her, with three children, one smaller than the other. She married her first husband, an infantry officer, for love, and ran away with him from her father's house. She was exceedingly fond of her husband, but he gave way to cards, got into trouble, and with that he died. He used to beat her at the end, and although she paid him back, of which I have authentic documentary evidence, to this day she speaks of him with tears and she throws him up at me. And I am glad, I am glad that though only in imagination, she should think of herself as having once been happy, and she was left at his death with three children in a wild and remote district where I happened to be at the time, and she was left in such hopeless poverty that, although I have seen many ups and downs of all sorts, I don't feel equal to describing it even. Her relations had all thrown her off, and she was proud, too, excessively proud, and then, honored sir, and then I, being at the time a widower, with a daughter of fourteen left me by my first wife, offered her my hand, for I could not bear the sight of such suffering. You can judge the extremity of her calamities, that she, a woman of education and culture and distinguished family, should have consented to be my wife. But she did. Weeping and sobbing and wringing her hands, she married me, for she had nowhere to turn. Do you understand, sir? Do you understand what it means when you have absolutely nowhere to turn? No, that you don't understand yet. And for a whole year, I performed my duties conscientiously and faithfully, and did not touch this. He tapped the jug 